I'd like to read from Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him behold my salvation. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that these are promises to each and other, each and every other believer. And we thank you for this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Jane is going to bless us with special music. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. 
Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, a hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had as understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you and thank you for this incredible passage of Scripture. And we pray that you would give us understanding through the power of your Holy Spirit as only he can give to us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, folks. I'd like to build on the messages from the last two weeks. Let me refresh your memory. Easter Sunday, we looked at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and I spoke to you about how God has raised us and seated us in Christ. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and we talked about the results of being justified by faith in Christ, by God's grace through faith and not works and how God gives us his peace, and now we have the hope of the glory of God. This is how God sees the believer, justified, raised, and seated in Christ. Now, years ago, I heard someone say there are four ways that we are seen. How we see ourselves, how others see us, how we want others to see us, and how God sees us. And how God sees us is what matters most. It is also true that there are many different ways to think. We can think positively. We can think negatively. We can think that the glass is half full or half empty. We can think for the here and now in the present. Or we might be thinking in regard to the future. We can also think spiritually. And we can also think in a worldly way. Now, Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinks, so he is. So our thought process is critically important. And there's many, many different ways to think. But for the Christian, there is only one way we should think, and that should be thinking biblically. We should be thinking with the mind of Christ. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to explore what it means to have the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says that believers have the mind of Christ. It is how God sees us, and it is also how he expects us to think. 
I alluded over the last two messages to us having the mind of Christ, but I really did not fully explore this truth. Now, this is an incredible statement that we ought to all be enthralled with. I want you to think about this for a moment. Believers have the mind of Christ. We can think like he thinks. What a tremendous spiritual tool in the arsenal that we have that God has given to us. And this is a truth that, some, that we should all thoroughly seek to know and to understand more about. Now, in order for us to do this, it's necessary first for me to build to lay some spiritual building blocks to get there. Perhaps you've heard the term agnostic. An agnostic is a term that refers to someone who says that God is not knowable. That's totally different from an atheist. An atheist says that there is no God, but an agnostic says that they believe in God, in a God, but that he's not knowable. The concept of God not being knowable is diametrically opposed to what scripture teaches us. Now, here are the critical building blocks to knowing God and having the mind of Christ. God has made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. The son of God enters history and time. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Old Testament scriptures pointed to that prophecy and that truth of Messiah coming. And so the law and the prophets spoke of Christ's birth. They spoke of him coming into the world. When we come to the New Testament scriptures, they explain to us the significance of Christ's life. John tells us in John chapter 1 verse 18 that Christ is God's revelation to us. He makes God known to us. John also tells us in 1 John chapter 1 that he was an eyewitness of Christ, an eyewitness of the word of life. John, uh, Jesus tells us, uh, tells his disciples the night before he died that he would send the Holy Spirit who would convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. John chapter 16, verse 8. So Christ dies. Three days later, he resurrects from the dead. Fifty days later, he is, or 40 days later, he ascends into heaven and he sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. Peter, after all these events years later, goes on to tell us that no prophecy of Scripture is man's interpretation or did it have its origin in men, but that it was given by the Holy Spirit to men. So God is the author of Scripture and also men have authored Scripture. So we have dual authorship. But the mind and the thoughts and the words and the concepts come from the mind and the heart of God to the writer of Scripture. The Apostle Paul further states in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that the gospel of Christ is not man-made, but that it came by revelation of Christ to him. So the Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Scriptures are critical components to possessing the mind of Christ. And so it works like this. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes into that person's heart. Christ takes up residence that, in that heart. And they are born again unto a living hope because they've responded to the message of the gospel of Christ. And so as a result of all these things, therefore, one possesses the spirit of Christ, and therefore they belong to him. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If a person doesn't possess the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to him. Now, as a believer receives Christ and possesses the Holy Spirit and possesses Christ, now therefore they possess the mind of Christ. Christ. 
Now, let me quickly touch on the conditions at the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 passage, we need to understand that Paul is writing to a troubled church. And it's a worldly church in its understanding of the gospel. It's a divided church with many, many factions. And there were a variety of teachers and teachings floating around in that fellowship that were not of God. False teachers had crept in. They presented a worldly wisdom that was devoid of Christ and devoid of the cross and devoid of Christ's crucifixion. They questioned the Apostle Paul's apostolic authority. They questioned the cross of Christ because they saw it as foolishness to them. And so what they were doing is they were undermining the gospel and upsetting the faith of some believers. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, for the word of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul writes to the Corinthian believers to set the record straight and to present afresh to them again that Christ is the wisdom and the power of God unto salvation. And he reminds the Corinthians that he did not come to them with persuasive words. He did not come with a worldly wisdom. He did not run around as this great orator or superior speaker. He gave them Christ. He preached Christ. He presented Christ. He presented the truth of the Holy Spirit and the word of God regarding Christ. And he relied upon the Spirit of God as he unfolded these things, that the Spirit of God would be the Corinthians teacher. And he understood that because they had the mind of Christ, that they could comprehend such truth. But like anything else, sometimes people mix truth with error, intentionally or unintentionally, which is what these false teachers did. And this is why the church was a troubled church. Now, here is the essence and the breakdown of the first Corinthians chapter two passage. There's two kinds of people. We have saved and unsaved. We have spiritual and the natural man. That is the person without the spirit. We have th those who have the spirit of God and those who do not have the spirit of God. And that leads to two kinds of wisdom, a worldly wisdom, or a heavenly wisdom. One wisdom, the worldly wisdom, is condemned and dismissed. The other wisdom, the heavenly wisdom, is commended and confirmed. And so the heavenly wisdom is confirmed through the Holy Spirit who has given us the mind of Christ. He exalts Christ. He points the church to Christ. He has given us the mind of Christ because he is also the spirit of Christ. And therefore, Christ's mind now gives us the capacity to understand such spiritual truth. We understand the truth regarding Christ as it is presented to us in Holy Scripture. We understand the spiritual things revealed to us about Christ in Holy Scripture. The glory of Christ, the glory of heaven, the truth of Scripture, the things that are freely given to us by God that we might know them. And so the believer has this recognition of Christ and his cross and how it leads us into the power and the wisdom of God unto salvation. The mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ, he opens up these things that we would naturally N not understand or see our on our on our own. Uh, for example, this this simple truth is illustrated in First Corinthians chapter two verse eight. Paul says that the rulers of this world, the Jewish leaders and Pilate, all who had a hand in the crucifixion of Christ, they failed to see and understand these things that he was the Lord of glory. They rejected Christ. They rejected his truth. They rejected his wisdoms and his teachings. And so they embraced the worldly wisdom with, an earl, with a worldly outcome. They crucified the Lord of glory. 
the Apostle Paul says, if they only knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. But they did not understand and they did not see. So these are all the spiritual building blocks that we put in place here to lead us to these questions. What is the mind of Christ? What are we to look for? How do we recognize it? The mind of Christ is a mindset. It is the result of having Christ in our heart. It is the result that comes from having the Holy Spirit. And it comes also off the pages of Scripture. And it, the mind of Christ gives us not only the capacity to apprehend these things, but the ability to understand these things and to think like Christ thinks. It gives us the capacity and the ability to know his heart, to discern his perspective, to sense his priorities, to discern his values and his desires, to discern, discern the difference between right and wrong and good and evil, to make good spiritual judgments that lead to godly decision making. His mind gives us his disposition and character concerning a particular matter how we act, how we are to react, how we are to speak wisdom and truth as he would speak. This is an incredible thing, folks, that God has given to us. And so the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us. He guides us in the things of Christ. He teaches us his truth. He teaches us by spiritually bringing to life our heart and our mind to see truth and error. And the Holy Spirit works in such a way to establish our hearts spiritually in Christ. And his influence helps us, therefore, to know the mind of Christ. To look at life from Christ's point of view. And as we embrace his mind, he conforms us to the image of Christ. A Christian lady a number of years ago expressed it this way. I know it when I hear it. Her mind recognized God speaking to her heart through a holy scripture or through a message or how God would take the scripture and give her application to her heart. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep also possess my mind and they are able to see and to know and to hear and to think and to act and react. And so... We have this capacity and ability to hear and to know God and to know his mind. And not only when it comes to salvation, but also when it comes to sanctification. Walking in him, living in him, growing in him, growing in his grace and knowledge. Now here's the caveat or the warning. Just because we have the mind of Christ does not mean that we know all that Christ knows. We are not infallible. No believer and no religious leader is infallible. Only God is infallible. And just because we have the mind of Christ doesn't mean that the mind of Christ is a silver bullet to all the stuff that is in the world. Spiritual growth is not given just because one has the mind of Christ. Why? Because we do not always use his mind. The mind of Christ has to be appropriated. It has to be used. It's like a muscle. It has to be engaged and harnessed and brought to bear. You have to work it. I'll give you a personal example. I am a political junkie. I follow the news and politics very closely and daily. And some of it can really make me angry. And I can feel and say and think and act and react, not with the mind of Christ, but with worldly wisdom. I can easily act out in a way where I do not use, harness, or appropriate, or bring the mind of Christ to bear upon my thoughts. The result when this happens, my response is not very Christian and it can actually get quite ugly. So the mind of Christ needs to be exercised. 
No, this doesn't imply that the mind of Christ is atrophied or that the mind of Christ is lazy or that the mind of Christ is out of shape. On the contrary, his mind is always there, ready, ready willing, active, sharp, like that two-edged sword that Scripture talks about. We just need the spiritual exercise to use it. We need to be sharpened to harness it. Now, make no mistake about it, it's difficult to maintain the mind of Christ in every situation in a world with many voices. But amazingly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, we take every captive, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What an incredible statement. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And when we don't, then we don't exercise the mind of Christ. And so if we don't do that, then mistakes will be made in our walk where we don't appropriate the mind of Christ. I liken it to driving directions. You know, you get good directions and you're going along and everything's great. And then all of a sudden at some particular point, you know, we make that wrong turn or we make a U-turn and next thing you know, we're thoroughly lost. And, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter in the real world if you're using a map book. Do they still make those things? Or if you're using a GPS, you can get lost. This is a true story. Uh, several years ago, I read of a situation where GPS was taking people to Death Valley. Now, Death Valley is in the, in the eastern part of California, bordering Nevada. And people would use their GPS, and next thing you know, they're totally turned around. They're thoroughly lost because the GPS was programmed wrongly. They run out of gas, and they eventually died because they succumbed to the elements. By way of illustration, the mind of Christ is intended to keep us from wrong turns. The mind of Christ is intended to keep us from going into Death Valley. And so God reminds us of his truths and his ways, and he keep, seeks to keep us from the spiritual error and spiritual deception that the devil and the world would love to put in our path. He helps us to deal with temptations. And so along the spiritual and the pilgrimage journey, there are spiritual markers of pitfalls. And God brings these things to our heart and mind because we have the mind of Christ. Now, clearly from this passage, the Apostle Paul indicated that they were not using the mind of Christ that God gave them. If you take a look at chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. They were infants in spiritual things. And so they were prone to be led astray because they were not utilizing the mind of Christ. Now, Paul also touches on how the mind of Christ and the spiritual process works in the believer to teach us. If you take a look at verse 13, let me uh, read that for you again. Uh, Paul says, the things that we were given, which we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. That is key. It's, it's taking scriptural truth, scriptural truth and the truth of Christ, in a way where God brings it together and communicates such truth to his children. We're on the verge of spring. Many animals will give birth to their young. And their young are fed in a way where they are nurtured. They can't have solid food right away. So what the mother will do is get the food and break it down so it can be digested. They then are weaned to more solid food over time. In a similar way, God feeds each believer with the truth as it is in Christ. So we grow up into him in all things. And so this is the process. This is what it looks like. The wisdom of God and objective truth of scripture is presented. 
The wisdom of God is Christ. And Christ and Scripture are brought together in such a way where God spiritually breaks it down for us. We, able, we are able to digest his truth. We are nurtured in it. We are built up in it. Where we become spiritually mature in Christ over time. And what God does is, as he shepherds us, he moves us on to other spiritual objectives in truth and the truth of his choosing that strengthens us in the faith. And so over time, we see a pattern of consistency emerge in Christ. We experience consistency in our walk. As we process the truth of scripture, we begin, begin to see life as Jesus sees it. I liken it to God weaving this spiritual basket so we can float down the Nile River, so to speak, escaping harm and being delivered like Moses. God weaves it all in such a way where we're protected from the elements and we're able to escape harm and we're provided for. It's a process. It's sanctification. Sanctification is a huge process. We're justified. We're, seed, we're raised in Christ. We're seated. And we're sanctified. We're made holy through the blood of Christ. And so God moves us on from glory to glory. And he begins to change us so we live holy lives. It's a process. It's called sanctification. It's a spiritual pilgrimage. Pilgrimage, And it's really not, it's really important not to get discouraged in all these things because sometimes, you know, we see that we go one step forward and two steps back. But we need to understand, we need to understand that in this life, we'll never get the all of Holy Scripture. We'll never understand it all, this side of Scripture, but we will get what God wants us to see and to know so he, bring, he can bring us along and shepherd us as he shepherds us. Uh, years ago, uh, I had some born-again uh, believing second cousins, and they lived in Florida. And shortly after I got saved, they came up to visit some other family in the Philadelphia area. And I was a new believer at the time, so I went over and I visited with my Uncle Eck and my Aunt Mary, along with my mother. And I remember uh, asking my Uncle Eck a question about Scripture. And I can't act actually recall what that question was or what the nature of the content was. But I asked him a question. And his response, I recall, his response went right over my head. It was like he was speaking Greek or Hebrew to me. Now, I was a young Christian. I didn't know much about Scripture, and I was still trying to find my way. But it demonstrates that I didn't, I didn't process or get what God had laid upon his heart to answer my question with. And I was actually too embarrassed and too proud to ask him to further explain but this taught me a very, very valuable lesson. I try, key word, try. I try to listen better. I keep asking. I keep seeking. I keep knocking. I keep going deeper. And this is what God wants us to do. And only in this way can we more fully lay hold of Christ's wisdom in God. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, we have a beautiful picture, not a beautiful, an actuality, of what the Bereans did. Uh, they listened. They kept asking. They kept seeking. They kept knocking. And they went deeper. Paul preaches the gospel in Berea, and many came to believe. But it was an amazing thing. The scripture says, that a noble thing was said about them. The scripture says that they were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians ran Paul out of, of a synagogue. They harassed him. They rejected his teachings in Christ. They didn't examine truth. 
But the Bereans received the message, as the scripture says, with eagerness. They examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So the mind of Christ is not only knowing and discovering spiritual truth. I mean, what good is wisdom if it cannot be applied? But God gives us this discovery. He gives us this knowledge. But he also gives us the grace to apply it. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 the Apostle Paul writes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about how Christ emptied himself. He didn't think highly of himself and equal along uh, on, the, on the level with God. But he submitted to God and God exalted him and raised him up. This is the mind of Christ to every believer. And it comes down to depending and relying upon the spirit of Christ. It's addressing worldly and sinful thought patterns. It's overriding those patterns with God's heart and mind. And it's not an easy thing to do because we've developed thought patterns of the world. I like what a dear brother expressed years ago uh, when it came down to our thinking and our doing and our saying and our being. That we've created spiritual mental ruts in our minds. We have worldly grooves that have been carved out. We have developed a default mindset producing a certain outcome. It's like electricity following the path of least resistance. And so what happens is we respond in an angry way rather than in a gracious way. Or we respond in malice rather than in mercy. The good news, God seeks to change all this we, because we can freely know what he's given to us. Before I close, I want to share a quintessential passage in our quest to lay hold of the mind of Christ. And it comes out of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Let me read that for you. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, report, if there is any excellent and anything excellent or if anything praiseworthy, let your mind dwell on these things. This is the classic put off and put on verse to change our thought patterns and processes. And I believe that this verse in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 beautifully expresses the outworking of Christ's mind to every believer. Whatever is true the mind of Christ. Whatever is honorable, the mind of Christ. Whatever is right, the mind of Christ. Whatever is pure, the mind of Christ. Whatever is lovely, the mind of Christ. Whatever is of good report, the mind of Christ. If there is anything excellent, the mind of Christ. And if anything praiseworthy, the mind of Christ to us. To sum it up or to conclude, to have the mind of Christ is to possess the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit opens his mind to us more and more as we are taught objective truth of Scripture. The mind of Christ is a mindset which welcomes the things of God in Holy Scripture. The mind of Christ gives us the capacity and the ability to know God and to think as he thinks. The mind of Christ needs to be utilized or used. The goal is that God's thoughts might overwrite our worldly way of thinking. And brothers and sisters, these things happen when we submit our hearts and our minds to him. I'd like to close with a prayer from a commentary written by R. L. Pratt when he wrote uh, the commentary First and Second Thessalonians. He says, Lord Jesus, you have given us the spirit to teach us a wisdom that is better than the world's wisdom. Have mercy on us and give us the ability to seek the spirit's wisdom in all of our ways. Give us the wisdom that comes from you as we deal with the world.
and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, may we continue to live in your grace and to find the mind of Christ and that we would seek to embark on that quest uh, like the Apostle Paul where we take captive every thought. We thank you that you've brought us into this grace. We thank you that we're justified and we're being sanctified, uh, that we've been raised and we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thank you for such an incredible honor and thank you that we have been given a beautiful mind, the mind of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.